Praise the Lord. Um, so first and foremost, I want to give my condolences once again to the grieving family. Uh, just know that the church is still here for you and we'll be praying for you. Um, next, I want to thank the youth elders for giving me a chance to speak from God's word. I'm not a speaker by any means. I'm usually in the back or playing acoustic or something. So uh, just bear with me and we'll get through this, all right? Um, and so let me just pray and we can begin. Father God, we just come before your presence, God. We just thank you again, God, for all that you've done. We just thank you again, God, for helping us throughout another week, Lord Jesus, and bringing us together as a church family, Lord God. God, as I'm speaking, Father God, let every word from my mouth come from you alone, you alone, Lord Jesus. And to you alone goes all the glory and honor and praise. In the name of Jesus, I pray, amen. amen. All right, so today we'll be in Romans chapter 3, verses 1 through 18. And the title of my message will be Stop Making Excuses. Um, so just as a background, as you're turning to Romans 3, um, in Romans chapter 1, we see Paul talking about the gospel. And as we all know, the gospel is the good news. And it makes us, and tells us how, uh, how God makes us right in his sight, as it says in Romans 1 verse 17. In chapter 2, we see Paul is addressing some Jews who thought that they had a special privilege before God. But Paul makes it very clear that the Jewish people will not stand before God as privilege, pri privileged people, but they will stand before God as unrighteous, like everyone else. But Paul knew that his audience would have a difficult time understanding this because after hundreds and hundreds of years of, um, you know, being called the chosen people and following the rules and regulations, it'll be really hard for someone to really grasp this new uh, concept of the gospel. So this leads us into chapter three and we see, and we see this back and forth conversation between Paul and, a, and an objector to the gospel. So someone who is making excuses because of the, uh, someone who's making excuses so, that, so they don't have to follow the gospel. And so today we'll look at some of those excuses in Romans chapter three, and then we'll take a look at some of the excuses that we make, and we'll see um, where these excuses come from or why we make these excuses in the first place. Um, and so let's start with, with verse one. one of, what advantage then is there being a Jew or what value is there in circumcision? So right off the bat, the Jews are like, okay, so what advantage is there in being a Jew? I mean, Paul, you of all people should know what it means to be a Jew. I mean, we are the chosen people, and does that mean absolutely nothing now? And this is Paul's response in verse 2. Uh, Much in every way, first of all, the Jews have been trusted with the, uh, with the words of God. So yes, there is an advantage of being a Jew. The Jews were entrusted with the words of God or the law. Uh, but more importantly, they have, been given, they have been given the promises through the prophets that a Savior is going to come and redeem not only the children of Israel, but the rest of the nations as well. So there is a value a value of being a Jew. And so we see here, uh, the first excuse that they make was based on their um, background or position. The second excuse we see in verse three, what if some were unfaithful? Will their unfaithfulness nullify God's faithfulness? So the Jews were like, okay, so we, so we got the word, but according to the gospel that you've been teaching us, uh, there are many Jews who have not been saved yet. Right? And because they're unsaved, they'll be separated from God forever. And so if this is true, God is unfaithful, right? And Paul says this in verse 4. Not at all. Let God be true and every human being a liar. So no, God will break, not break his word and he will stay true to his promises. Right? And so this is what Charles Spurgeon had to say while he was reading this passage. So what if some did not believe? It is no new thing. For there have always been some who have rejected the revelation of God. So just because they, the people have uh, failed to believe doesn't mean that God has failed them, right? God is always faithful. As it says in Deuteronomy 7 verse 9, it says, Understand therefore that the Lord your God is indeed God. He is the faithful God and who keeps his covenant for a thousand generations and lavishes his unfailing love on those who, obey, uh, on those who love him and obey his commands. So the third excuse that we see is in verse 5. And it says, but if our unrighteousness brings, brings out God's righteousness more clearly, uh, what shall we say? That God is unjust in bringing his wrath on us. So now the Jews are like, okay, because of somehow our unrighteousness reveals the value and worth of God, right? So we should keep on sinning even more to glorify uh, God's glory more brightly. And Paul was like, certainly not. No, the focus of these people was not to glorify God, but they're trying to give free reign to their lustful desires. And so these are the three excuses that we see 
in this passage. And if you look at this list, I mean, they're no different than the excuses that we make today, right? But there's one sentence that always comes up when we make excuses, and that is, um, if you can go to the next slide, if it wasn't because of fill in the blank, my life would be better, right? So I'll give you guys two examples. Uh, one of my friends from Norman, while we're playing basketball, he's always like, if I didn't break my leg, then I'll be in the NBA, right? And another example is, for all the students here, because it's final season, uh, if it wasn't because of my teachers, then I would have better grades. Um, and I made that excuse many times before. Um, but these are excuses that we make, and you can put anyone or anything in that fill in the blank. But from these six verses, Paul wants us to know that we can't keep on making excuses to cover up for ourselves, right? And we need to admit that we are at fault and not blame others and God for our actions. So why do we make these excuses? If you can go to the next slide. We kind of inherited this trait from the first human beings that God created, right? So if we go all the way to the beginning, we see Adam and Eve in the, in the garden, and they're working, and then the serpent comes, right? And so Adam and Eve eats from the tree of good and evil, and eventually they hide themselves because there's shame and fear. But then God starts pursuing them and calls out to them, and what do they do? Adam starts blaming Eve, and Eve starts blaming the serpent, right? And so we see that they fail to recognize that it's their own fault. Um, and we also see that even before the blaming started, that there was a deeper issue inside of Adam and Eve, and that deeper issue is inside of us today, and that is sin. And so if you look at Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 11, Paul is pointing out sin in every single part of our life, right? And so in verse 10, we see, uh, we read, it reads like this, there's no one righteous, not even one. So right off the back, uh, Paul is saying, we are all sinful, Right, Our legal standing before God is guilty. Verse 11, there is no one who understands, so our mind is sinful. Uh, verse, verse, still in verse 11, there is no one who seeks God, so our motives are sinful. Uh, verse 12, all who have turned, aw all have turned away, they have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. So we have a willingness to rebel against God. Right, So we have changed, exchanged God for man-made things, as we read in in Romans chapter 1, in verse 13 and 14, their throats are open graves, their tongues practice deceit, the poison of vipers is on their lips, and their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness, right? So our mouths are sinful, right? So our speech is corrupt, we're dishonest, right? And so in verse 15 through 17, their feet are swift to shed blood, ruin and misery mark their ways, and the way of peace they do not know. So our conduct is sinful. Our relationships with one another is broken. Verse 18, and this is the big one. There's no fear of God before their eyes. So ultimately, our relationship with God is broken, right? So this is the main issue inside of all of us, and it's that, that we're all corrupted by sin. So I'll give you guys a quick illustration, if you can go to the next slide. Um, so imagine if you have dirt, right? And this represents sin and evil, and you, and you have a clear glass of water, and this is uh, before sin came into the world. And if you put some dirt in the water and stir it up, what will it do? It will become dirty, right? Every molecule in that glass of water will become dirty to some extent. Um, and so if you take a droplet and put, on your, and put it on your hand, that droplet will have some degree of dirt in it. So even though this is water to some extent, there's another substance that's making it, a differ that's making it different from its original state. And so we are the same way. We are human beings created in the image of God, but there's corruption in our lives. Right, and the only way we can be free from this dirt of, dirt of sin is through the washing of the blood of Jesus. Right, so furthermore, we should know that even though we are still capable of sinning because we are humans, we are not slaves to sin anymore, as it says in Romans 6, verse 6. And this is where our excuses stem from. And so King David gives us a good example. Uh, if you look at Romans chapter 3, verse 4, um, uh, Paul is actually quoting Psalms 51. Right, and so Psalms 51 is King David's confession of sleeping with another man's wife and then eventually killing the, other, uh, ki killing the woman's husband. So even though David has done all these things, look what he says in Psalms 51. Have mercy on me, O God, because of your unfailing love, because of your great compassion, blot out the stains of my sin. Wash me, from, or wash me clean from my guilt. Purify me uh, from my sin, for I recognize my rebellion. And so just circle that, for I recognize my rebellion. It haunts me day and night. Against you and you alone have I sinned. I have done what is evil in your sight, 
and you will be proved right in what you say, and your judgment against me is just. So as you can see, David stops and recognizes that the problem is within himself, right? And so this is the type of example that we need to follow uh, throughout our lives. And so I'll ask the worship team to come forward. And so what do we talk about today, right? We talked about the excuses that were made because of the gospel in Romans chapter 3. And then we looked at some excuses that we make. And finally, we took a look at where these excuses come from. And that's from a deeper issue inside of all of us. And so to conclude, let me say this. Um, there's going to come a day when God is going to come back, right? And God is going to eventually speak. And, all the, and on this day, all these excuses will come to an end. And because God, because God is going to have the final say, right? And whoever doesn't confess their sins will be held accountable for their actions. And so what do we have to do? right? We don't have to do anything special. We can, we just have to start by coming before God and saying, I know my sin. I know I, ha I know what I've done is evil in your sight. I know I can't blame anyone else and it's all my fault, right? And so, and then God will meet us and he'll start transforming us, uh, transforming us on a daily basis. And so this is a question that I'll just put out for you guys to ask for yourselves. Are you going to reevaluate your life and confess your sins to God, or will you continue to make excuses for your circumstances? Right. Uh, may God bless you with these words.